Namo tassa bagawato, Arahato, Sama, some Buddha sa, Namo tassa bagawato, Arahato, Sama, some Buddha sa, Namo tassa bagawato, Arahato, Sama, some Buddha sa. So this is the last section of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, Diganakaya 16, the um, Sutta of the Buddha's Last Days. And we've left the Buddha on his uh, last night on earth. He's uh, at uh, a little uh, little grove outside of Kusanara. He's lying on the uh, in the lion's posture on his right hand side, and the various. Um, monks and and uh, other people and dewas are coming to see the the buddha for the last time the final passing of the buddha so we'll begin and the lord said to ananda ananda it may be that you will think the teacher's instruction has ceased now we have no teacher it should not be seen like this ananda for what i have taught and explained to you as dhamma and discipline will at my passing be your teacher. Dhamma and discipline is Dhamma Vinaya. And whereas the monks are in the habit of addressing one another as friend, it's in Palaya Vuso, this custom is to be abrogated after my passing. Senior monks shall address more junior monks by their name, their clan, or as friend, Avuso whereas more junior monks are to address their seniors either as Lord or Venerable Sir, that's Bhante. So that's still um, the custom today, and it may vary from place to place, but uh, in Thailand it's generally, you can refer to monks within um, three years seniority of you are, uh, on either side are considered uh, your peers and they're, they're all of Wuso, but anyone beyond that is, is to be addressed as Bhante. If they wish, the order may abolish the minor rules after my passing. And that that sentence was to cause a lot of trouble at the first council because this is another point that they brought up against Ananda because uh, he didn't ask the Buddha to clarify what is meant by the lesser and minor rules. And at the first council there was a discussion about it and they couldn't agree where to draw the line, which rules were to be considered lesser and minor they decided to keep all the rules and not uh, not abolish any of them. So here we have the Buddha making some last kind of uh, almost administrative uh, pronouncements, how the monks should address each other and they may abolish the minor rules. And then in the next sentence he says, after my passing, the monk Chana is to receive the Brahma penalty. But what, Lord, is the Brahma penalty? Whatever the monk Chana wants or says, he is not to be spoken to, admonished, or instructed by the monks. Chana was the Buddha's uh, charioteer in his lay life when he was the prince. Chana was his charioteer. And um, when... Uh, the Buddha, you know, went forth, and when he became, uh, when he established his, he became enlightened and established his order. Channa was one of the early monks. He followed his former master and became a, a bhikkhu. But as the years passed, uh, Channa was kind of hard to deal with with the other monks. He kind of um, lorded it over them and was proud. He was sort of like I knew the Buddha back when, you know, when, back in back in the old days, and uh, he, he became careless about keeping the rules. He thought he was special. So now the Buddha is saying he has to be punished and admonished by 
the Brahma penalty, which uh, uh, is called the Brahma Danda. Danda means literally means stick, but uh, it figuratively means a punishment. So Brahma means divine or, or the, you know the highest. This is like the worst punishment. No one is to admonish him. No one is to speak to him or instruct him. You know. After some time of this treatment, Chana mended his ways and became a good bhikkhu. Then the Lord addressed the monk, saying, It may be, monks, that some monk has doubts or uncertainties about the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, or about the path or the practice. Ask, monks, do not afterwards feel remorse, thinking the teacher was there before us, and we failed to ask the Lord face to face. At these words the monks were silent. The Lord repeated his words a second and a third time, and still the monks were silent. Then the Lord said, Perhaps, monks, you do not ask out of respect for the teacher. Then, monks, let one friend tell it to another, but still they were silent. And the Venerable Ananda said, It is wonderful, Lord, it is marvelous. I clearly perceive that in this assembly there is not one monk who has doubts or uncertainty. You, Ananda, speak from faith, but the Tathagata knows that in this assembly there is not one monk who has doubts or uncertainties about the Dhamma, the Buddha, the Dhamma, or the Sangha are about path or practice. Ananda, the least one of these 500 monks, is a stream winner, incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of Nibbana. So a stream winner, that's the first stage of enlightenment. And one of the characteristics of a stream winner is that they have firmly established faith. So they don't, they no longer have the mental hindrance of wichikicha, or uncertainty or uh, doubtful mind. And incapable of falling into states of woe, certain of nibbana, another characteristic of a stream winner is they'll never take a lower rebirth, a state of woe meaning being reborn as an animal or in hell or a ghost that's not possible for them. So sometimes when someone attains stream entry and in the suttas, they, they utter the phrase, the gates of hell are shut for me. And they're certain of nibbana within seven lifetimes. Then the Lord said to the monks, Now, monks, I declare to you all conditioned things are of a nature to decay. Strive untiringly. These were the Tathagata's last words. This is... Um, Uh, been translated in slightly different ways. The Pali is Vayadama Sankara Apamadena Sampadeta. One of the other translations is work out your salvation with diligence. Accomplish earnestly. Apamadena means like heedless. So diligently is a good rendering. And these are the last words of the Buddha. So we can put some emphasis on that statement because it, 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 the Buddha felt it was the most important, his very last chance to, to instruct everybody and the last teaching of the Buddha. And it's two parts expressing the impermanence of all things. All conditioned things are subject to falling away. All, all conditioned things are subject to uh, destruction and decay. And then, uh, so that's in a statement of reality, and then an uh, admonition to practice. Strive on untiringly, or strive on diligently. So make an effort because everything is falling away. Your time is limited, so make the most of it. And then the Lord Buddha spoke no more after that. That's his last words. Then the Lord entered first jhana, and leaving that, he entered second, the third, and the fourth jhana. Then leaving the fourth jhana, he entered the sphere of infinite space, then the sphere of infinite consciousness, then the sphere 
of nothingness, then the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, and leaving that he attained the cessation of feeling and perception. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Venerable Anuruddha, Venerable Anuruddha, the Lord has passed away. No friend, Ananda, the Lord has not passed away. He has attained the cessation of feeling and perception. So what's going on here? The Buddha is going into jhana and he goes through all the four uh, jhanas and then he enters the formless states, the formless jhanas beginning with boundless space and ending with neither perception nor non-perception, then he enters Naroda Sampati, which is translated here as cessation of feeling and perception. Naroda Sampati could be called the ninth jhana. It's a, a very refined state of mind that is only accessible by, by uh, anagamis or arahants. It's an ordinary person can't enter into it because it's kind of an immersion in Nibbana. And it's said that someone who's in the road of somebody, from the outside, there's no way to tell that, that they're not dead because there's no sign of breathing or heartbeat or anything. So Ananda thought he had already passed. But Anuruddha, who was the disciple with the most developed uh, dibachaku or divine eye, it's a kind of extrasensory perception, he knew what mind state the Buddha was in, and he reported that, no, he has not yet passed, he is in Naroda Sampati. Then the Lord, leaving the attainment of cessation of feeling and perception, entered the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. So he's going now back down through the jhanas. From there he entered the sphere of nothingness, the sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of infinite space. From the sphere of infinite space, he entered fourth jhana. From there, the third, the second, and the first. Leaving the first jhana, he entered the second, the third, the fourth. So he went all the way down to first jhana, then back up to fourth. And leaving fourth jhana, the Lord finally passed away. And at the blessed Lord's final passing, there was a great earthquake, terrible and hair-raising, accompanied by thunder. And Brahma Sahampati uttered this verse. Brahma Sahampati is uh, the Maha Brahma. He's a very powerful deity. And uh, he uh, has a close association with the Buddha's life because he had first uh, approached the Buddha after the Buddha's enlightenment when the Buddha was inclined not to teach. He thought, what's the use of trying to teach people? They're all bewildered by sensuality, they won't listen to me, it'd just be a waste of my time. And Brahma Zahampati came down and begged him on bended knee, Venerable Sir, for the out of compassion for sentient beings, please instruct the Dhamma. There are those with little dust in their eyes who will be saved by the Dhamma. And that passage, that phrase of Brahma Zahampati, that's what... Um, Laurie chanted at the beginning, it's the request for the Dhamma talk is taken from that. It's um, The original was Brahma Sahampati begging the Buddha to teach, and now it's traditional before a Dhamma talk for one of the lay people to uh, basically play Brahma Sahampati and request the teaching out of compassion. But here, at the Buddha's passing, Brahma Sahampati utters this verse, and again, I'll, I'll say that these, uh, this translation, the verse sections are, are, you can tell in the printed text, you can see it's meant to be verse because it's like the, the um, indentations are different. But it's, the um, translator made no attempt to imitate the cadence of the Pali. Pali verse has a very rigorous meter. So here's the uh, translation of the verse. All beings in the world, all bodies must break up. Even the teacher, peerless in the human world, the mighty Lord and perfect Buddha, has passed away. And Saka, ruler of the Dewas, uttered this verse. Saka, of course, is the king of Tawatinksa heaven. Impermanent are compounded things prone to rise and fall. Having risen, they're destroyed, they're passing truest bliss. And that uh, 
that verse in Pali is Anicca Vada Sankara Upadwa Yadami no Upajitawa Nirujanti Te Sang Wu Pasamo Suko. That's um, traditionally chanted at funerals to this day. This is where that's the the origin of that verse. And Nietzsche Wada Sankara. Impermanent are compounded things, prone to rise and fall. Having risen, they're destroyed, they're passing truest bliss. Then the Venerable Anuruddha uttered this verse. That's the senior bhikkhu we encountered earlier, the one with the most developed dibhachaku, or a deva vision, or divine eye. No breathing in and out, just with steadfast heart. The sage who's free from lust has passed away in peace. The mind unshaken has endured all pains. By Nibbana, the illumined mind is freed. Then the Venerable Ananda uttered this verse, Terrible was the quaking, men's hair stood on end when the all-accomplished Buddha passed away. And those monks who had not yet overcome their passions wept and tore their hair, raising their arms, throwing themselves down, twisting and turning, crying out, All too soon the Blessed Lord has passed away. All too soon the welfare has passed away. All too soon the eye of the world has disappeared. But those monks who were free from craving endured mindfully and clearly aware, saying, all compounded things are impermanent. What is the use of this? No. So the monks who would attain to the destruction of craving, which means that they're at least anagamis, they just nodded their head and said, so it is, so it is, that all things are impermanent. There's a, uh, a, um, a little, I don't know what you'd call it, a verse or a saying uh, from um, some Mahayana source that says that uh, when the Buddha died, all the animals in the world cried except the cat who just cleaned his paws. <laughs> <laughs> Then the Venerable Anuruddha said, Friends, enough of your weeping and wailing. Has not the Lord already told you that all things that are pleasant and delightful are changeable, subject to separation, to become otherwise? So why all this, friends? Whatever is born, become compounded, is subject to decay. It cannot be that it does not decay. The Dewas, friends, are grumbling. Well, the Dewas are grumbling because some of the monks are weeping and wailing. Venerable Anuruddha, what kind of devas are you aware of? This is Ananda asking. Friend Ananda, there are sky devas whose minds are earthbound. They are weeping and tearing their hair. And there are earth devas whose minds are earthbound. They do likewise. But those devas who are free from craving endure patiently, saying all compounded things are impermanent. What is the use of this? Then the Venerable Anuruddha and the Venerable Ananda spent the rest of the night in conversation on Dhamma. And the Venerable Anuruddha said, Now go, friend Ananda, to Kusanara and announce to the Malas. The Satas, the Lord has passed away. Now is the time to do as you think fit. Yes, Lord, said Ananda, and having dressed in the morning and taken his robe and bowl, he went with a companion to Kusanara. This is the little town in the back of beyond, and the, the Buddha died just outside of it. At that time, the malas of Kusanara were assembled in their meeting hall on some business, and the Venerable Ananda came to them and delivered the Venerable Anuruddha's message. And when they heard the Venerable Ananda's words, the malas were struck with anguish and sorrow. Their minds were overcome with grief, so that they were all tearing their hair. Then the malas ordered their men to bring perfume and wreaths and gather all the musicians together. And with the perfumes and wreaths and all the musicians, and with 500 sets of garments, they went out to the sal grove where the Lord's body was lying. And there they honored, paid respects, worshipped and adored the Lord's body with dance and song and music. 
with garlands and scents, making awnings and circular tents in order to spend the day there. And they thought, it is too late to cremate the Lord's body today. We shall do so tomorrow. And so paying homage in this way, they waited for a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth day. And on the seventh day, the malice of Kusanara thought, we have paid sufficient honor with song and dance to the Lord's body. Now we shall burn his body after carrying him out by the south gate. Then eight Mala chiefs, having washed their heads and put on new clothes, declared, Now we will lift up the Lord's body. But they found they were unable to do so. So they went to the venerable Anuruddha and told him what had happened. Why can we not lift up the Lord's body? Vasetha, your intention is one thing, but the intention of the Dewas is another. Lord, what is the intention of the Dewas? Vasetas, your intention is having paid homage to the Lord's body with dance and song to burn his body after carrying him out by the south gate. But the Dewa's intention is having paid homage to the Lord's body with heavenly dance and song to carry him to the north of the city, bring him in through the north gate and bear him through the middle of the city and out through the eastern gate to the Malish shrine of Makuta Badana and there to burn the body. Lord, if that is the Deva's intention, so be it. So the Devas were, for some reason that's not really explained, they had a very particular idea of, of the, the route that the Mala should carry the corpse and take it to be cremated. At that time, even the sewers and rubbish heaps of Kusanara were covered knee-high with coral tree flowers. And the Dewas, as well as the Malas of Kusanara, honored the Lord's body with divine and human dancing and song, and they carried the body to the north of the city, brought it through the north gate, through the middle of the city, and out through the eastern gate to the Malas shrine of Makuta Bandana, where they set the body down. The coral tree flowers refer to the Parichataka flowers, which are the blossoms of the tree in Tawatinksa heaven. And it's supposed to be unusually beautiful and delightful scent, has a delightful scent, and the day was rejoice in the tree and the, the flowers from the tree. They're beyond anything in the human world. And... Uh, when the Buddha entered Parinibbana, the Dewas showered the whole area with these blossoms that are of heavenly beauty and scent until the whole area was knee-deep in them. And the uh, couple of things about the Parichataka tree, the, um, the Dewas have uh, periodically every... Uh, certain time of the year, they have a Parichataka festival where they play for several days and sport in their, around the tree and they, they throw the flowers at each other and, and when the flowers strike them, they give off this scented powder, you know, and, it, and it, it's kind of a game or a sport they have. And when the Asuras were thrown out of Tawatiksa heaven at the beginning of the the world age, and they were thrown down to their, their land at the bottom of the, the mountain. The Asura city is kind of a mimicry of Tawatinksa, and they kind of forget that they're not in heaven until their tree blossoms, the Chitipala tree, and when that blossoms, that it's not as pretty, and they say, oh, we've been fooled, this isn't Tawatinksa at all, and then they... And they get riled up and try to swarm up the mountain and get back to Tawatinksa. So they're carrying the body out through, through the city. Then they ask the Venerable Ananda, Lord, how should we deal with the body of the Tathagata? Vasetas, you should deal with the Tathagata's body as you would that of a wheel-turning monarch. And how do you deal with that, Lord? And this passage is then uh, had been in the previous section elaborated. Here we just have an abbreviation. The Satas, the remains are to be wrapped in a new linen cloth. This they wrap in teased wood cotton wool. Then having made a funeral pyre of all manners of perfumes, they cremate the king's body and they raise a stupa at the crossroads. 
Then the Malas ordered their men to bring the teased cotton wool, and they dealt with the Tathagata's body accordingly. Now just then, Venerable Kasapa the Great, that's another one of the, uh, Maha Kasapa, another one of the uh, uh, senior uh, great bhikkhus, Mahakasapa was traveling along the main road from Pawa to Kusanara with a large company of about 500 monks. And leaving the road, the venerable Kasapa the Great sat down under a tree. And a certain Ajiwaka, that's Ajiwaka is an um, ascetic from another tradition, and a certain Ajiwaka chanced to be coming down the main road towards Pawa. And he had picked up a coral tree flower in Kusanara. So this ascetic is coming along the road with a parichataka blossom in his hand. So immediately Kasapa knew something was up. The venerable Kasapa saw him coming from afar and said to him, Friend, do you know our teacher? Yes, friend, I do. The ascetic Gotama passed away a week ago. I picked up this coral tree flower there. And those monks who had not yet overcome their passions wept and tore their hair. But those monks who were free from craving endured mindfully and clearly aware, saying, All compounded things are impermanent. What is the use of this? And sitting in the group was one Subada, who had gone forth late in life, and who said to those monks, Enough, friends, do not weep and wail. We are well rid of the great ascetic. We were always bothered by his saying, It is fitting for you to do this. It is not fitting for you to do that. Now we can do what we like and not do what we don't like. So already there's, you know, trouble. This, uh, and this is kind of, this is actually still in, um, in Thailand today. It's still kind of a trope or a stereotype that someone who ordains it late in life, he ordains as an old man. He never, they're too stubborn to, uh, or fixed in their ways to really properly, you know, properly behave. Um, there's actually jokes about it. We, we call a, an elder, a senior elder monk that w that we respect. You know, his title of respect is Lung Pa, a venerable father. Here's the Ajahn Cha, is Lung Pa. But uh, one of these old men, who, you know, someone who ordains as an old man, they call them Lung Tao, which means, you know, venerable uncle. It's kind of a, a joking name. So this um, statement, it's not really uh, gone into in this text, but in the Vinaya texts, this statement of Subada was the inspiration for Kasapa to call the first council. You know, he, he realized already that the Buddha's body is not even cremated yet, and already there's kind of schisms starting. Now this is what happens when a great teacher passes. You have to be very diligent to prevent the teaching from disintegrating. So this was the inspiration for Kasapa. We need to call a council, get all the senior monks together and agree on what is the Dhamma and what is the Vinaya and fix it for once and for all. We can't have people like the Subhada going, making up their own Dhamma Vinaya. But the Venerable Kasapa the Great said to the monks, friends, enough of your weeping and wailing. Has not the Lord already told you that all things that are pleasant and delightful are changeable, subject to separation and becoming other. So why all this, friends? What is born become compounded, subject to decay. It cannot be that it does not decay. Meanwhile, four mala chiefs, having washed their heads and put on new clothes, said, we will light the Lord's funeral pyre, but they were unable to do so. They went to the venerable Anuruddha and asked him why this was. Vesetas, your intention is one thing, but that of the Dewas is another. Well, Lord, what is the intention of the Dewas? The Satas, the Dewas' intention is this. The Venerable Kasaba the Great is coming along the main road from Pawa to Kusanara with a large company of 500 monks. The Lord's funeral pyre will not be lit until the Venerable Kasaba the Great has paid homage with his head to the Lord's feet. Lord, if that is the Dewas' intention, let it be so. Then the Venerable Kasaba the Great went to the Mala Shrine at Makuta Bandana to the Lord's funeral pyre, and covering one shoulder with his robe, joined his hands in salutation. 
and circumambulated the pyre three times, and uncovering the Lord's feet, paid homage with his head to them, and the five hundred monks did likewise. And when this was done, the Lord's funeral pyre ignited of itself. And when the Lord's body was burnt, what had been skin under skin, flesh, sinew, or joint fluid, all that vanished, and not even ashes or dust remained, only the bones remained. Just as when butter or oil is burnt, no ashes or dust remain, so it was with the Lord's body. Only the bones were left, and all the five hundred garments, even the innermost and outermost cloth, were burned up. We remember from last time the description of how a Tathagata or a wheel-turning monarch is cremated. They were wrapped five hundred times. And when the Lord's body was burnt up, a shower of water from the sky and another which burst forth from the cell trees extinguished the funeral pyre. And the malas of Kusanara poured perfumed water over it for the same purpose. Then the malas honored the relics for a week in their assembly hall, having made a latest work of spears and an encircling wall of bows with dancing, singing, garlands, and music. And King Ajatasattu Uedihiputti of Magadha heard that the Lord had passed away at Kusanara, and he sent a message to the Malas of Kusanara. The Lord was a Katya, that is a warrior noble, and I am a Katya. I am worthy to receive a share of the Lord's remains. I will make a great stupa for them. And the Lechavis of Vesali heard, and they sent a message. The Lord was a Katya, and we are Katyas. We are worthy to receive a share of the Lord's remains, and we will make a great stupa for them. The Sakyas of Kapalawatu heard, and they sent a message. The Lord was the chief of our clan. The Buddha, of course, was a Sakyan. We are worthy to receive a share of the Lord's remains, and we will make a great stupa for them. The Bulayas of Alakapa and the Kaliyas of Ramagama replied similarly. The Brahmin of Waitadipa heard and sent a message. The Lord was a Katya, I am a Brahmin. And the Malas of Pawa sent a message. The Lord was a Katya, we are Katyas. We are worthy to receive a share of the Lord's remains, and we will make a great stupor of them. And hearing all this, the Malas of Kusanara addressed the crowd, saying, The Lord passed away in our parish. We will not give away any share of the Lord's remains. So you've got all these envoys from all these different kingdoms and republics coming together and claiming the, the Buddhist uh, relics. And it's a very tense moment. It was elsewhere described, I think it's in the commentary, that uh, this almost resulted in bloodshed. It could have been a, a war fought over the, the Buddhist relics. And the... Um, on hearing this, the Malas of Kusanara addressed the crowd, saying, The Lord passed away in our parish. We will not give away any share of the Lord's remains. At this, the Brahman Dona addressed the crowd in this verse. The Brahman Dona was a, a Brahman who became a disciple of the Buddha. And he, he, uh, he was, uh, at this time, uh, it said he was an anagami. Although the, this is uh, perhaps doubtful, because there's also a story in the commentary that he snuck a, uh, one of the Buddha's teeth out of the funeral pyre and hid it in his turban. And it's not the kind of behavior an anagami wouldn't do. And uh, and the Saka, the king of the gods, saw that and stole it from Dona, and took it up to to Tawatinsa to put to put it in a stupa in Tawatinsa. But anyways, that, you know, that's, these are all kind of legendary stories. So this is what uh, a verse that um, Dona uttered. Listen, lords, to my proposal. Forbearance is the Buddha's teaching. It is not right that strife should come. From sharing out the best of men's remains, let us all be joined in harmony and peace, in friendship sharing out portions eight. Let stupas far and wide be put up, that all may see and gain in faith. Well then, Brahma, you divide up the remains of the Lord in the best and fairest way. Very good, friend, said Dona, and he made a good and fair division into eight portions. Then he said to the assembly, Gentlemen, please give me the urn, and I will erect a great stupa for it. So they gave Dona the urn. 
And now the Morias of Pipalawana heard of the Lord's passing, and they sent a message. The Lord was a Katia, we are Katias. We are worthy to receive a portion of the Lord's remains, and we will make a great stupa for them. There is not a portion of the Lord's remains left. They have all been divided up, so you must take the embers. And so they took the embers. Then King Ajatasattu of Magadha built a great stupa for the Lord's remains at Rajagaha. The Lachawis at Vesali built one at Vesali. The Sakyans of Kapalawatu built one at Kapalawatu. The Bulayas of Alakapa built one at Alakapa. The Kaliyas of Ramagana built one at Ramagama. The Brahmins of Vedadipa built one at Vedadipa. The Malas of Pawa built one at Pawa. The Malas of Kusanara built a great stupa for the Lord's relics at Kusanara. The Brahman Dona built a stupa for the urn, and the Mauryas of Pipalawana built a great stupa for the embers at Pipalawana. Thus eight stupas were built for the relics, a ninth for the urn and a tenth for the embers. This is how it was in the old days. And I think that sentence, this is how it was in the old days, was probably added to the text at the time of King Ahsoka, maybe at the Third Council. Because uh, in Ahsoka's lifetime, when he was the emperor of India, he uh, broke up these stupas and distributed the relics further. He wanted to cover every corner of his empire to have a, a stupa. Traditionally, it's said he built 84,000 stupas in this way, but this is you know, probably the Indian penchant for really big numbers, and 84,000 is a favorite. But he built a lot of stupas and distributed the relics around to the various stupas. So there was these eight stupas and then one for the relics and one for the urn. That was how it was in the old days. And that is the, the last sentence in the original text. Then there's a verse, the commentary says, was added in Sri Lanka in later times. Eight portions of relics there were of him, the all-seeing one of these. Seven remained in Jampudipa with honor. The eighth in Ramagama is kept by Naga kings. One tooth the thirty gods have. Kalinga's kings have one, the Nagas too. They shed their glory over the fruitful earth. Thus the seers honored by the honored. Gods and Nagas, kings and noblest men, clasp their hands in homage, for it is hard to find another such for countless aeons. So the, um, the tooth relic that's still the most precious possession of the Sri Lankan Sangha was the one that was uh, taken to Kalinga and it eventually found its way to uh, to Sri Lanka. So we can see that this verse was added you know, to sort of give the um, the heritage of that uh, uh, of that object. So this is the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Sutta of the last days of the Buddha, and um, uh, the events that this section today dealt with his passing and with the events transpiring around his um, uh, cremation. I'll add one more further note that uh, we have this scene where the, all the, the kingdoms were competing for the Buddha's relics and it became very tense. Uh, when Ananda came to his own death, when he lived to, to a very old age of 120, so he lived for another 40 years after this time, he didn't want to have and uh, he didn't want to have such a, a scene occur. He didn't want people fighting over his relics. So what he did was he levitated over the middle of the Ganges River and burst into flame. So there'd be nothing for anybody to fight over. <laughs> and so this is the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. <laughs> 